Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I see people are still coming into the room, but we can begin at this point as uh, I see we already have uh, quite a few people with us. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Alex Zaposochny. I'm publisher of the Rochester uh, Beacon. And for those of you that are not familiar or, or as familiar as you could be with the Rochester Beacon, we are a digital nonprofit publication that focuses on doing in-depth reporting and also informed opinion pieces that focus on the Rochester, New York region and the various complex challenges uh, and issues uh, that we face. We publish every single day uh, and also once a week, we send a free weekly email that has all of our content. So for anybody who has not signed up for that free weekly uh, email, uh, please go to rochesterbeacon.com and we will also be posting a link uh, later on in the, in the program. One of the things, of course, we want to make sure that we do is thank our various sponsors who made this program today possible. Uh, thank you very much to Arm Brewster Capital Management and also to Burke Group. And uh, we also have uh, words from a couple of our sponsors. Hello, everyone. I'm Bill Monty, the founder of the Estate Legacy and Long-Term Care Planning Center in Western New York. And I'm proud to be one of the main sponsors of this very timely Rochester Beacon event. One of the key planning areas that I'm focusing on with clients lately is the tax efficient transfer of their IRA wealth to the next generation, particularly after the passage of the SECURE Act earlier this year, which has dramatically changed the rules as to how IRA beneficiaries are taxed. My mission is to help you disinherit the IRS to make sure they're never a financial beneficiary of your estate. I recently completed an informational webinar entitled How Your Kids Can Inherit Your IRA 100% Tax-Free, which covers specific planning strategies that you can utilize to help accomplish that objective. You can watch the webinar by simply clicking on my practice's name in the invitation that you receive for today's event. If you'd like to learn more about my practice and the specialization of my practice, please feel free to call me at 585-721-2385. Thanks so much. Please be well. Good afternoon. The past six months have presented unimaginable challenges. Throughout it all, Bond has been with you. We've helped you make sense of guidance from the government and keep up with the revolving door of new rules. We've been here as the world paused and we are here for you now as the world rolls back into motion. We here at Bond wish all the best to you, your friends and families. Be well and be safe. Thank you. So first, uh, let me introduce John Harris. Uh, John is a Pittsburgh native who spent two decades at the Washington Post covering local politics, state politics, and national politics. He has authored two books, including The Survivor, Bill Clinton in the White House. In 2007, he co-founded Politico, one of the most successful digitally focused journalism startups of the past 20 years. He stepped down as editor-in-chief last year, but continues to cover national politics as a political columnist. Our other speaker today is Tom Hamburger, Tom Hamburger grew up in Brighton and has worked as a journalist since 1976. Now with the Washington Post, he is an investigative reporter focused on the intersection of money and politics in Washington. In 2018, Hamburger won a Pulitzer Prize and the George Polk Award for his work on ties between the Trump campaign and administration and Russia. He is also a political analyst for MSNBC. Uh, welcome. I see John Harris. How are Thanks, you? Alex. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you okay. I think we're waiting for... Oh, I think something happened to Tom. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Join us uh, here momentarily. So, John, as we're waiting for Tom, maybe you can tell us about your childhood in uh, Pittsburgh. Sure, I grew up in Pittsburgh um, uh, at a handful of different places. Graduated from Pittsburgh Sutherland High School in class of 81. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, you know, the time is marching on. Uh, you said you're uh, 1989 from, uh, from Brighton High School. That's getting up there as well. And uh, my first job in journalism was in Rochester. Uh, I suppose if you go really back, uh, I was delivered the uh, Democrat and Chronicle when I was in eighth grade. That's how I... Uh, 
uh, followed the 1976 uh, presidential election, but then uh, I had an internship for the afternoon paper. Many of you will remember the Rochester Times Union uh, that was still going uh, the summer of 1983. So I spent a great summer uh, reporting and learning about journalism. Uh, I was in college at that time um, when the Times Union was still with us. Yeah, actually, I happen to be a DNC uh, uh, newspaper boy as well. So, <laughs> well, let me start off with you. And I think we're, we're having a little bit of an issue connecting uh, Tom Hamburger back up, but that'll happen. But let's start off uh, with you and really start talking about the presidential uh, election first. Uh, it seems that every four years, uh, voters are told that this year's or that year's presidential election is the most important one of their lifetime. The stakes couldn't be higher. Uh, this year, I think most people can agree that Donald Trump is a an atypical candidate and that we are living through something that's quite uh, an unusual set of events. As a longtime Washington journalist, what stands out most to, to you about this presidential election and how important do you think this election is compared to others you've seen during your time in Washington? Well, um, you know, for I'd say the past four years, uh, continually uh, living through events where you'd say uh, that, that shatter my expectations, shatter my previous context for how politics is supposed to work or for what might happen, uh, um, things that had been in the category of, oh, that would never happen, keep happening. Uh, so it's really extraordinary in, in that sense. Um, uh, you know, somebody earlier today was asking me about October surprises, and it seems that we've probably had a half dozen <laughs> just since the month got going with President Trump's illness, uh, with the uh, craziness of that debate the other night. We may yet have more uh, surprises to come. What I would say is uh, uh, it makes sense to say, well, this is the most consequential election because President Trump represents such a departure from uh, from previous norms of politics. Somebody was making the point to me the other day, I thought it was an interesting way of looking at it, maybe it'll be the least consequential. And, and this person's point was that uh, attitudes about politics uh, are so hardened uh, that the electorate is so polarized and really the fundamental question uh, about how you interpret all the news uh, uh, these days is how do you feel about President Trump? Do you, do you like him or you dislike him? Uh, we've had these monumental events, including the, the, the pandemic, that don't really affect the basic dynamics of politics very much. President Trump has a very, very solid floor. He doesn't go below it. Uh, his support's that strong. He's got a very, very firm ceiling. He doesn't go above it. Uh, too many people uh, dislike him. No matter uh, what has happened, all these uh, uh, really cataclysmic events, um, especially the uh, the pandemic, they don't change that fundamental dynamic. The main variables, how do you feel about President Trump, and the floor and the ceiling are, are very narrow. It's interesting that you say that. You may recall that there was a pretty uh, popular book that came out called This Town a number of years ago. Sure, by Mark Liebel. Uh, he used to be a colleague of uh, mine at the Washington Post. I think he had both, Mark and I, had left before Tom uh, arrived at the Washington Post. Right. And part of the premise of his book is that actually for quite a few years, there was this growing narrative that things had uh, from, to, to people kind of outside of Washington, that Washington had been fundamentally uh, changed. But that the reality is for those who make their living in Washington, those who uh, are in high elected office in Washington, things actually didn't seem uh, quite, quite as different as, as they or quite as contentious as they seem, uh, seemed outside of Washington, D.C., are, are you saying that you think that the last four years, tr tr I mean, uh, unlike before, where we heard that things are changing in Washington, uh, do you think the f those, these last four years have created some real permanent changes in D.C.? Uh, I think it's um, uh, entirely possible that they have. I'm a great admirer of Mark Leibovich, the author of that book, This Town, a little bit of a skeptic about the, uh, the thesis that he sketched in that particular book. I think he was describing a certain uh, social uh, set, a journalistic set, um, basically his set, the people he hangs around with, um, uh, and uh, made the mistake of assuming that's the real Washington. In my view, there, there is no single real Washington. There's different pockets of power um, uh, throughout um, throughout the capital. Um, uh, most of which were never mentioned in Mark's book. Uh, I used to believe, Alex, uh, that something was true, which was that for all the uh, discussion of how polarized we are as a country uh, in ways that everybody in the audience will, uh, will understand, that if you were to take uh, influential people from both parties, 
from the, the executive branch and the, uh, the congressional branch and put them in a room, no cameras allowed, no publicity, and therefore no political consequences, um, that the actual problems uh, could be solved with relative ease and wouldn't require any side to fundamentally abandon uh, uh, core principles. They'd have to uh, compromise at the margins, but not in ways that uh, would lack integrity. The, in other words, the 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 polarization was a feature of our politics, not necessarily a feature of the substance of the problem. Um, uh, and I, I think that was true uh, for a lot of the last generation. I'm not sure that it is any longer. I do think uh, President Trump has uh, so divided the lines. Are, are you with him or are you against, uh, are you against him that um, the, the, the polarization isn't just a feature of the uh, 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 of politics as it plays out in the media, that there, there's something very fundamental there. Um, and the, the, sometimes people use the word tribalism. Uh, that tribalism that marks our politics uh, is actually a feature of the, the, actor, the political actors themselves. The, the most influential people tend to view things in terms of which tribe are you on. So I, I think it's safe to say that you had a particularly strong response or, or, or reaction to what we saw last week with the presidential debate. I, your, your, your column was featured and shared uh, often, I saw. Uh, can you talk about uh, what, how you think that the, um, these particular set of, of debates, including the VP debate, which normally isn't necessarily thought of as particularly consequential, but the age of, of Joe Biden, given uh, some question about, well, what, how does Trumpism go on after Trump at some point? Sure. Uh, you think about uh, the debates this year and how relevant are they? Um, well, I did uh, have strong words about uh, uh, that uh, debate last week. I, I think I wasn't the only one to have that reaction. I thought it was a national embarrassment. Um, you know, one of my mentors was uh, David Broder, the, the late Washington Post columnist, and uh, he said something often, and it sounds a little bit Boy Scoutish, but uh, he, uh, he believed it, and, and I guess uh, deep down I do as well. You have to remember always, the election does not belong to the candidates, it doesn't belong to the reporters, it belongs to the voters. And I can't think of anything more contemptuous of voters than the, that spectacle of the first debate. Uh, and uh, uh, you couldn't follow it if you wanted to. I watched the whole thing because uh, um, I'm paid to. I happen to know there's some people uh, with us on the, on the call now who didn't watch it. They hit uh, mute or turned it off after a few minutes. Um, you know, the debates, I think, again, almost everything is viewed through the prism of how do you feel about President Trump? Do you share his uh, uh, contempt for the politics of the status quo and, and like the way he's the disruptive force? Uh, or, or do you feel like he's uh, violating norms and, and somehow an expression of contempt um, um, that's, that's hazardous for us? Uh, I, I think the debates are going to be viewed through, through that prism. Obviously, the vice presidential debate, there's going to be uh, uh, a lot of attention on it because of President Trump's illness and Joe Biden's an elderly man. So it does uh, uh, focus attention on something that ordinarily is a bit of a sideshow. And uh, I see that Tom Hamburger has joined us. Sorry for whatever technical difficulties uh, we, we had in, in, in getting you on. But uh, John has been very ably holding down the fort and talking about national politics uh, the debate we had last week uh, and, and this election. Yeah. Uh, Tom, it would be great to get your, uh, your, your thoughts on how unique is this presidential uh, election uh, really from your standpoint. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry for the technical problems and, and um, uh, qu uh, uh, quickly, and I wonder if this compares with what, how this compares with what John is saying, because I missed his comments, which are the most valuable. Um, but it's unlike anything um, I've seen in covering presidential elections, and I've been assigned to them since, uh, since 1980. Um, it's extraordinary. And we're just in a period that is, um, you know, what are the, it, it, almost every phrase one would use sound, sounds hackneyed, right? Unbelievable, unprecedented. Um, I think all of those apply. I kind of found myself very sympathetic with our, my colleague at the Washington Post, Alexandra Petrie, who, please said, who said, please, no more news, um, because things are happening so quickly, Alex, that it's um, challenging to absorb, not only to write about them and assess them, 
um, um, uh, but to absorb their significance and to put them in perspective. And it does seem, as Alexandra wrote in her column, like we fear going to sleep or take, taking a breather for 20 minutes because we don't know what's going to happen next. Well, and maybe that takes us actually to focusing a little bit on the state of journalism. Uh, what you just said, Tom, was, was interesting because you're, of course, an investigative reporter. And so by definition, you're spending weeks, months, and not just you, but, but a team of, of, of people looking at things. And then you put something out after a lot of work, uh, and it just becomes one of maybe a hundred things that, that seem to have been talked about. And then sort of the cycle quite often of, of, of how long uh, what used to be big news, what used to really drive multiple election cycles and sort of stay with us, uh, it seems it's, it's hard to kind of penetrate uh, at this point. What are your thoughts as an investigative reporter about what this, the state of news and kind of the state of uh, this mix between journalism and politics has done to the kind of work that you've, that you've done for many years? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question, Alex, because um, there is a sense that major stories that would dominate the political discourse um, in, in, in cycles past are now um, neglected and almost forgotten. Um, the example uh, that occurs to me and those of us at the Washington Post a bit painfully is the New York Times expose on Donald Trump's tax returns, showing that in some years he paid just 750 all sorts of questions raised by that report, which I think at another time would have dominated um, the national conversation, would have dominated the discussion at a debate and the Sunday talk shows. Um, now it's uh, still in the background, but um, almost uh, uh, as soon as that story appeared, it was replaced by other seemingly more urgent headlines. So it's a great question and it is something that's frustrating to, to I think to all journalists who like to dig in on a specific topic is that our attention span has shrunk and it seems necessarily shrunk, Alex, because of the extraordinary things that, have ha that are happening this news cycle. And, 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 and you and John are probably, and, and, and your listeners and your readers at the Beacon are, are well aware of this. It's not just the virus. It's not just the tax story we talked about. It's the post-George uh, Floyd civil unrest. We've got a Supreme Court opening. Um, the, 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 the Western United States is on fire. And, the, and that's just a few stories. Any one of them would have dominated discussion and could have been a centerpiece of a past presidential campaign debate. And John, your, your thoughts on the, on the state of journalism and how you think it's evolved in, in recent years and decades? Well, the point that Tom's making is a really good one. And I think it's not just about journalism, but it's something about the nature of uh, modern life and how saturated we are uh, with information. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, this precedes the, uh, really the, the, the Trump administration, but we have trouble remembering what we were indignant and up in arms about, uh, you know, the day before yesterday, uh, because we're, uh, some new stimulus will come along and, and we're up in arms and indignant about that. There, there's something about uh, um, uh, modern life, which, uh, which the hazard is that it shreds memory and it shreds attention span and it, and it shreds, uh, the, the great hazard of that, Alex, is that it will shred accountability. Um, uh, how can we hold uh, politicians uh, accountable if, if we you know, can't, uh, you know, keep the signal uh, of what's important, or if every piece of news, uh, like the, the example Tom mentioned with uh, uh, President Trump's taxes, is uh, uh, put through the prism of, uh, well, which side are you on? Um, uh, I, I think it's a, um, it's a problem, and uh, um, uh, maybe just something we're going to have to become accustomed to, citizens, uh, that uh, how to distinguish between uh, 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 things that are, are seem huge in the moment and what's really important. Um, I, I think journalism and news organizations have a critical role in helping an audience uh, distinguish uh, between what's of lasting importance and, and what's of momentary importance. And, uh, um, you know, it, it's why the challenge to a news organizations, the local level, I think the national level, uh, there, there's more success stories at the local level. We're still really eager for more success stories. Uh, why I think it's uh, uh, why I think it's so important. Well, I'm sure both of you have spoken to to readers uh, that have said to you probably some of the same sort of things that uh, 
I mean, yes, perhaps readers have changed, their attention spans have changed, but that, that I mean, their criticism is that that journalism itself has has changed, uh, and that uh, what used to be more about being trustworthy, objective journalism, that that's given uh, increasingly given way to political bias or or uh, news outlets. I mean, particularly more so uh, television uh, based news than, than than written journalism, but generally journalism. Uh, that's fear of, of, of bias as well as kind of the stoking of fear, outrage, etc. How fair of a criticism do each of you think that is of journalism as, as it stands today? And, and what are your other kind of biggest concerns uh, of, of what journalism needs to overcome to get that, uh, to, to get a, 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 a better place in, in, in the public side? Who would you like to tackle? And, and, and uh, Tom, perhaps you can start. Sure. Um, well, I'd have to say because of the, uh, uh, the, the, the because of its existential nature, the first problem uh, that we face at all news organizations is one of uh, 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 of a financial model that will work in an internet era. The um, as uh, uh, John knows very well, and you do too, uh, Alex, as publisher of a newspaper the uh, the the old um, advertiser uh, based uh, um, subscription model is um, of print publications um, is really a thing of the past and so the first question for all news organizations and um, uh, to my uh, a great chagrin because I grew up in them to regional newspapers around the country um, um, uh, this is a dire dire um, situation um, so so Starting point would be, I guess, number one would be finding a workable financial model. The second, um, if I understood the, your, your question, Alex, it's, it's also about the complaints that you're hearing and we're hearing as well, I'm sure John's getting them too, about um, a new and obvious political, uh, political biases that have emerged in journalism. Now, the president, of course, is, is um, on a regular basis insulting the sort of mainstream press and suggesting what we're reporting is fake news. In this environment, it strikes me that one of the things that would be most helpful is to have as a, a publication, and I think the Washington Post uh, uh, strives to do this, I think Politico does as well, um, to be a credible source of news that regardless of your political persuasion, you can um, rely on what you are reading or seeing on the political website, on the Washington Post website. And it strikes me that this, this um, credibility issue is huge right now, um, not only because we're being disparaged as a source of fake news, but because in fact there is a new element of um, a political um, a sympathy a bias that shows up in news columns and particularly in broadcast these days, and, and I'm concerned about it. And John, I mean, is, is the uh, criticism fair of, of, of the press and how it's evolved in recent years? It's possible, Alex, that there's a, um, a, a historic change underway in news media um, uh, about the, the sort of basic assumptions and the assumptions that Tom and I grew up with and, and that uh, um, were taught to us by an earlier generation, uh, the notion that uh, news organizations uh, can uh, re report the news in a fact-driven way. Um, you never can achieve, uh, it, it's outside the grasp of, of uh, people, but you can, uh, perfect objectivity. Uh, um, ben Bradley, the, the great editor of the Washington Post, says hey, nobody can be perfectly objective, but you can be fair. Uh, even a child at the youngest age understands uh, two or three years old. Well, wait, but that's not fair. Uh, um, people understand intuitively that concept of fairness, and they understand the concept of, uh, I'm going to present you the best version of the facts that I can come up with, and then we can have an argument about those shared facts. Uh, increasingly, we, we, we've seen uh, people reject that model and, and um, uh, put news through primarily through an ideological prism. That's what Fox News does. That's what uh, MSNBC does. And, uh, um, and in that model, you don't even necessarily agree on what the relevant facts are. No, you're not arguing uh, around a common square. I don't like it. And I, I hope that's not where we go. I think you have to raise the, the prospect that it's at least conceivable that we're moving more toward a British model. Um, or some other European countries where most of the news organizations, you know, they're, they're pretty well understood uh, by their audience. Well, they're, they play for the shirts, um, uh, they play for the, for the skins. 
actually in, in the United Kingdom, it's different. Uh, the TV stations, because the news is dominated by the BBC, is the kind of archetype of, of, of supposed to be independent, uh, politically independent, that is, uh, um, even though it's, uh, it's subsidized by the government, um, uh, but not on uh, one side or the other of the political base. And the newspapers are fiercely partisan in the way that we associate with, with Fox or MSNBC. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't welcome that here, but I do have to acknowledge that this possibility of that's where, uh, where we're headed. It will be interesting now is where, when we come out of the, the Trump era, whether that's in four weeks, election four weeks from today, uh, or that's four more years, um, uh, both on business grounds, uh, where do we, where does the business stand? A lot of news go to the local level, but a lot of national news organizations are doing great in the Trump era because there's so much interest in political news. Um, um, and uh, uh, then as far as the editorial model, what does it look like in the, in the post-Trump era? Do we go back to the more traditional news values as, as kind of I understood them. You know, every tide that comes eventually rolls out. And it's not until the tide rolls out, you, you find out, you know, who's wearing swim trunks and who's not. So each of you has actually had a unique experience with innovation in journalism. Uh, in the case of you, John, obviously, as, as the founder of Politico, uh, you are one of the still relatively few people and <laughs> even working at the Washington Post where the world's richest man has come in, bought the paper, started focusing on all sorts of uh, areas of innovation that hadn't been focused on before. I would love to get each of your thoughts on those experiences and maybe starting off with you, John, what is it uh, that, what are the lessons from building Politico uh, that you think were particularly uh, relevant, especially uh, as it relates to others that are trying to build a new model for journalism? Sure. What we uh, set out to do uh, at Politico, and, and I think on the big questions we, we achieved, what we set out, which was to take these historic values of journalism that we're talking about here and that Tom's describing so well. Uh, uh, th those historic values mean uh, uh, a commitment to fairness and to facts, a, a, a sense of, of relevance, um, and a, a commitment to hold people in public life accountable. Those are our kind of core values that we wanted to vindicate for a new age in which the platforms of journalism were changing, the expectations of the audience were changing, um, uh, uh, everything was changing, but we, we wanted to vindicate old values in a chaotic new age. Uh, in doing so, we wanna make a distinction between things that are values you can't compromise on and things that are more habits or conventions uh, where a lot of those you, uh, you do have to throw out. Like, well, we, this is how we've always written it. Um, um, uh, this is how we organize our day. Uh, uh, those aren't values, those are, are just habits and you have to be really ready to discard them. Um, if you're gonna be responding to the audience from an editorial point of view, responding to the, uh, the marketplace uh, from, a, from a commercial point of view. To me, the great uh, challenge for journalism or anybody that's uh, creating content is how do you produce content that you can in some way command a premium from the audience? I say command a premium, mean you don't put yourself in a commodity situation. Um, uh, uh, the, the web and social media are, are ruthless in, uh, in, in kind of driving down the price of commodity news. Um, and you can't uh, fund the kind of journalism that we want to do in a co with a commodity business model. You've got to command a premium. What are the two ways to do that? One, you produce content that's so compelling that you can charge advertisers a premium uh, to, to be against that content. Uh, they they so are, are so attracted to the audience and the engagement of the audience that they'll pay a lot to be there. Uh, that's one way. The other way uh, is maybe the more promising way long term is it's enough of a premium. Somebody's willing to pay for it. They're, they're not just going to click on it. They're going to get out the damn wallet and put the credit card down. Um, uh, we've got a, a big subscription component to our business um, where we're able to command that premium. So anyway, I, I do think that model is a uh, the basic truth of that. How do you command a premium for your content? Uh, that's going to be the question in, in when it comes to covering national news. It, it's the question if you're in Rochester or you're in Minneapolis, uh, is how can we uh, create content that, that's deserving of a premium and then how do we capture it? And Tom, what, what has it been like uh, being in a newspaper that's uh, owned and, and 
uh, being innovated from within by uh, Jeff Bezos. I have to tell you that part of the experience of, of my joining uh, the Washington Post, I guess about a decade ago, was um, that the uh, staff and the management of the Post were, were in mourning then because John Harris and his colleague uh, at the Post, Jim Vandehei, had left. Um, not only because they're terrific um, uh, 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 journalists who, who were really um, sort of icons um, for, 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 for great reporting in Washington as reporters, but they were also embracing this new model and they did something extraordinary um, and something that was terribly worrisome to, the, to those of us who were left at the Washington Post. Um, uh, and there was a real question um, at the end of the Graham era, as wonderful as it was, about whether the Post would survive in an era when new public, when, when, when new news forms, including those invent, like the one invented by um, uh, John Harris and Jim Vandehei, how the Post would do competing against the, that, um, these, and how the Post would be able to um, adjust to changing times. Um, the Graham family was, and Don Graham in particular, was always interested in changing technology and wanted the Post to be at the front end of it. And so I think part of the Post legacy was to carefully choose the next owner. And Jeff Bezos is someone who not only embraced the Graham family's traditional notions of, of journalism, journalistic fairness, accuracy, and credibility, the ones John just referred to and that Politico has also embraced. But Bezos, in a slightly different um, uh, view than that adopted by John, uh, Jim, and, and the uh, folks at Politico, um, also is very competitive and had his own view on how a news organization might survive and thrive in the internet age. Um, briefly, his approach was one to expand readership as rapidly as possible. His goal, make the Washington Post the most, the most read and relied upon uh, news source around the world, not just in Washington. In fact, we were a little worried when he first came in because he wasn't that interested in the print product or in our traditional dedication to Washington, the city, and local news coverage. Um, and um, uh, uh, one of the things that he did when he came in, he did adopt a traditional news owner's um, uh, distance from the news gathering process. So we did not feel the hand of Jeff Bezos on the news side. That was left to our editor, Marty Barron, who formed a terrific partnership with Bezos. What Bezos did in his few and occasional and sometimes kind of secretive visits to the Post, we're told, was come in and ask about things like download speed. He was obsessed with it. How quickly after someone clicked on an article or a video would it appear on their computer? A guy who started and succeeded with Amazon was understandably very sensitive to the customer experience. And so making the post a platform that people would look to around the world and making the post one that was technologically appealing and that was an, exp a, an appealing experience was vital to him. And it's one of the ways, one of the things that he introduced and insisted upon after he took over at the post. Well, one, uh, there are a couple of questions that are coming in from audience members that are, are, are that I think relate to this uh, somewhat. Uh, I mean, one question, I, uh, I don't think you necessarily need to answer this exact question, but basically says, if you could get rid of social media and kind of go back to the way things were, <laughs> would that be an improvement or not? Uh, but perhaps more, more broadly, um, to both of you recall times before social media was a key part of how journalism was, was delivered. Uh, as, as journalists, as Washington journalists, what do you think the effect has been of, of social media in terms of the way it's changed journalism uh, and the way that, that content uh, is, is now uh, received and thought about by readers? And maybe John. If you, want to start. Um, you know, I would not wish uh, to uh, turn the clock back just because that's really not a, a um, not a viable way to uh, to, to go through life. Uh, um, the whole idea of Politico is that we would be forward looking after the question of what's next for journalism, rather than trying to cling desperately to an old model. So I, I recoil at the, uh, the idea of like, well, could you just wish certain challenges go away? That's not life. You can't just wish they go away. I will say I do believe that social media is uh, uh, exacerbating some of the trends that uh, uh, we describe um, uh, the difficulty in really focusing attention in a sustained way on the questions that are most important uh, 
uh, as Tom mentioned, sometimes it's stories that uh, should uh, would dominate the news for months. Um, they might spur investigations, congressional inquiries. They have the attention of everybody. They can pass like a, you know, leaves, uh, a bunch of leaves in the wind. Um, uh, and I think that's exacerbated by social media and, and the idea of uh, um, uh, news personalities who are view covering the news largely through the prism of their um, their own perspective, their take, uh, uh, in some cases their biases. Uh, that's a big. Uh, a big challenge uh, as well. You don't get uh, a million followers by being uh, kind of a sober and detached. Uh, you, you, you get those by being uh, uh, kind of in the fight. Uh, so it is different. Um, I don't think that it uh, negates um, the, the, the serious work that only professional journalists are backed by responsible owners uh, who, who uh, have a commitment to, to serious, uh, uh, deep journalism. Um, nobody else can do that. Uh, Twitter is going to uh, be up in arms over some investigative uh, uh, disclosure that Tom and his colleagues uh, produce, and that's what they're going to uh, be going wild over. We wouldn't know it if it weren't for Tom. Or, or with a similar uh, investigative journalist at, uh, at Politico doing that kind of work. That's where the real value is. Um, uh, it, it's Tom bringing his uh, expertise, uh, his sourcing, his, his professional values. It's not Tom popping off with whatever his opinion is uh, uh, on any given damn subject. It, it, it's his reporting. So, so, so Tom, we talked about how investigative journalism in some ways a little bit different than other forms of journalism. How is, uh, how do you view social media and its impact on the work that you've been doing over all these uh, years? Well, well, I, I concur with John that there's, that, that we aren't going to be able to turn social media back. I think it has a couple of effects, um, has had a couple of effects, both, both pernicious. Um, um, uh, one is that it, um, it, it has, we, we've shortened attention span of the news cycle, readers, the way that kids and all of us actually relate to, to news and information. Um, we've all got attention deficit disorder. And um, my diagnosis would be that social media is, plays a huge role in that. Um, at the same time, there's this other effect with, which John and I observed, and I know John did covering the, the Clinton White House and others, is that presidents are always looking for ways to reach their um, audience in, in, in new and different ways. And we've seen um, uh, uh, the Trump campaign and, the, and Donald Trump emerge as really the most um, sophisticated um, users of, of social media. Um, and it has presented an alternate pathway for information and sometimes disinformation. Getting to the latter point, disinformation, as John just noted, I think we have, given this short attention span, given now the multiplicity of news sources, there's a crisis of, uh, uh, of, credi of credibility that news organizations have, that public figures have when they offer statements, and the place to turn, and I'm hoping this will be not only the challenge for us, but maybe um, uh, the key to future success for Politico, the Washington Post, and the Rochester Beacon, is that people are hungry for a credible and reliable source of information and that they'll turn to us. Well, one of the other uh, crises, especially with regard to local journalism, as, as, as you both know, uh, in addition to credibility is, is also just financial resources. Uh, there are a couple of questions uh, that we've received about uh, news de local news deserts and, and uh, the particular challenges of local news. Uh, and, and I know, Tom, uh, in your case, you started off uh, being a journalist uh, in in local, uh, at local newspapers. What are each of your thoughts, beginning with Tom, uh, about, uh, first of all, of course, the relevance of, of local news and what, if anything, can be done to uh, make sure that it does not kind of fall victim to the increasing uh, financial difficulties uh, that, uh, that, that newspapers are facing? Alex, I do think it's one of the, the vital um, uh, challenges of our time is how to continue local news coverage, regional news, news coverage. Um, it's why I'm so pleased to be here with the Rochester Beacon. Um, appreciate what you are doing. Maybe I could just briefly tell the story of, of one of the 
um, my one of the newspapers I started with early in my career was the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Um, and some years ago, both the Minneapolis paper and the St. Paul paper were taken up over for a brief period of time by owners who were um, basically run by out of town hedge fund folks. At the Minneapolis Star Tribune, they suddenly lost a really vast and sophisticated political news uh, an experienced political news team were laid off so that there was just there were just a few reporters left at the state capitol where once there were more than a dozen uh, uh, sophisticated political reporters. The art staff was largely laid off and so a group of, uh, 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 of, of local um, business folks and newspaper folks, including the former publisher of the Star Tribune, came together at that time to form something called MinPost, which in some ways um, I, I find a lot of parallels to the Rochester Beacon. And they, this was a decade ago. The local papers, and particularly the Star Tribune, have improved considerably since then. But MinPost is making it. It's a viable paper with really good correspondence, political uh, 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 reporting, a Washington correspondent. They've opened a Washington bureau. And they're doing it through a kind of hybrid, I, I call it the sort of public radio model, where they have local subscribers and philanthropic contributions that keep this um, MinPost organization going, covering the congressional delegation, state politics, doing some investigative work, and uh, competing some with the, with, with, with the uh, mainstream daily, uh, the Star Tribune, which is now in local hands and better funded once again. Um, but to me, it's a journalistic success story, and one, um, as I hope the Rochester Beacon, two years old now, will turn out to be, and will say in a decade that you've achieved the same uh, success and viability. So. That's, that would be uh, uh, my hope for the future is that new models can, will and can emerge with strong community support. Excellent, thank you, Tom. And, and John, your, your, your thoughts, I don't know if you've ever worked in local, as a local reporter or. or... Well, uh, I certainly did um, um, uh, at the Washington Post, uh, which was uh, especially uh, uh, then, uh, was a, a preeminently a, a local paper in addition to one that had a national profile, but its business model was uh, driven primarily by its strength uh, in the Washington area and uh, uh, a large reporting staff, uh, uh, much larger than it has now, incidentally, um, uh, where, um, you know, scores of journalists who went on to have major impact uh, in the profession started in uh, Northern Virginia, as I did, or, or covering the District of Columbia or covering the, the suburbs of Maryland. Uh, so uh, yes, I also relate to Tom's experiences on the importance of, of local reporting. Um, and incidentally, Minneapolis is a good example because I think that challenge uh, from MinPost is, uh, uh, and the change in ownership has made that paper a lot better. Uh, the editor there, Rene Sanchez, is an old colleague of mine. From yes. And a friend, and, and it seems to be doing uh, um, good work a at a time when it's so important. Uh, you know, that's the city where George Floyd's death happened, uh, and, and the, the the city and the state uh, went into uh, uh, into total turmoil. Uh, so th that underscores what we're talking about: why it's important to have uh, first-rate reporting. Um, big events happen, and, and responsible citizens want to know. Uh, it, um, know what's going on in their communities in a professional and enlightened, with professional and enlightened journalism. Um, you, to me, the model, Alex, is uh, at the local level, has got to have a, a greater reliance on uh, uh, subscriptions. Uh, advertising might continue to be a part of it, um, uh, but I think in a lesser and lesser part of it. Uh, if you're driven, unless you can capture that premium somehow with sponsorship and whatnot, then you're chasing clicks, which isn't the way to produce great journalism. Um, uh, to me, there's pretty good uh, models in terms of how we all view entertainment now, right? We, uh, we, we pay um, uh, Netflix and we pay Amazon and uh, uh, Showtime and, and other services. And once we, uh, um, once we do, we, we kind of don't notice uh, that the, uh, the, the money's coming out each month. It's really adding up, making those wealthy uh, corporations and, and funding a lot of content. We're happy to be done with the ads. Um, uh, I think something like that is uh, the future of local news. It may not have as big an audience in every individual community, but it's going to have a really high quality audience that values the content enough that they're, they're willing to spring for it. And, and probably the greatest uh, hurdle is, is just the uh, uh, getting over the, the 
pulling out of the credit card, right? I don't know if you sometimes are clicking around, you want to read the article about it, they want you to sign. Even if they don't want money, they want you to sign in and do all the stuff, tell you address and say, oh, to hell with it. I'm not going to bother. If we could uh, uh, make that a much easier process so that it's just a click, I, I think we, you'd have uh, a lot more people willing to engage and, and uh, the people most who care most, I, I think, would would part with money for it. Um, we do for Netflix, and, and we we do and would I think for really a first rate coverage of our community. So there are a couple of questions that have come in, kind of taking us back a little bit to the to the political and election uh, landscape that we're living in. Uh, one of those questions I think is interesting is what are each of your thoughts about what happens after Trump, whether that's in four weeks or, or, or four years. What happens to uh, the Republican Party? It, does Trumpism, uh, can it exist beyond Trump or does it go back to uh, looking like Jeb Bush and Mitt Romney and, and kind of what are the dynamics you see uh, playing out uh, uh, once, whenever it is that Trump is finally off the stage? Maybe we could start with you again, John. Um, I don't think that uh, we'll go back to uh, a kind of Mitt Romney um, I, I don't think that it's going to be, you know, remember that old show Dallas where it turned out a whole season was just a dream sequence. It didn't really happen. Uh, I think some people have that fantasy about the Trump years. Oh, we can just go back to how it was. Uh, uh, we can't. And, and let's recall that how it was wasn't necessarily that great. Um, uh, the, uh, Trump's an expression of the deep divisions uh, in our political culture, he's not uh, somebody that uh, just invented them. Uh, I think that um, there will be a variant of uh, a, a kind of a, a post-Trump version of, of Trump politics. I, I think that's there. Uh, and then I think they're in the Republican Party. And I think um, uh, also in the Republican Party, we're going to see uh, a search for uh, the Republican version of Bill Clinton. Uh, Bill Clinton, remember, came out, it came, emerged within the Democrats when they had lost a bunch of elections and they were clearly losing um, uh, the support of historic constituencies and not attracting new constituencies. And, and Bill Clinton was a, a brilliant defensive politician. Uh, he he's, he's, uh, was kind of a yes, but um, politician. Yes, um, uh, we, um, um, we also want to uh, believe in balanced budgets, but we're not going to go as far as these Republicans that, who are, are too ideological. Um, and he practiced the politics of reassurance, like, hey, you can trust me. I'm, uh, we're not crazy liberals. Uh, I think the Republicans are going to have a, a, a version of that. Hey, I'm a Republican. You can trust me, though. I'm not hostile to, uh, uh, to gay rights. I'm not hostile to, I, I, I don't practice the politics of hate. I, I practice the politics of inclusion. I'm a yes, but um, uh, a Republican. And I actually tend to think that's the, probably the future of the Republican Party and the right politician, uh, just as Bill Clinton could really uh, uh, keep the Democrats in the game. Uh, uh, the, 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 a Republican version could do that. Uh, I think that's the battle that's going to go on in the Republican Party between, hey, I'm the next Trump uh, versus, hey, I'm the next Bill Clinton, but a conservative version of Bill Clinton. Uh, Democrats also are going to have a similar battle, right? They, uh, between people who are, uh, uh, hey, let's just uh, uh, let's be a centrist Democrat. Let's be responsible. Between people say, like, look, the politics as it was uh, uh, of the status quo don't work. Um, that's why Trump happened in the first place. We've got too much inequality, too much systemic racism, uh, too much uh, tolerance for uh, certain problems that uh, really need a much more aggressive and even radical approach. And, then, and the Democrats are going to have that version. Because even in Joe Biden's own description, he's kind of a placeholder at age 77, 78, if he wins and takes office. Uh, so the question of what's next is... Uh, I mean, it's always the most interesting question in politics, what's next, but it, it, it's uh, arriving now with a kind of a ferocity and intensity that's really interesting, I think. So, so Tom Hamburger, what's, what's yeah. next in your, in your opinion? So, so I have to tell you, Alex, the question makes me nervous for this reason. It assumes that there is a next chapter. Maybe it assumes that Donald Trump is not going to be around. Your question did, in fact. And it reminds me of the old Mark Twain quote, which actually applies to Donald Trump in a couple of ways now. Um, when, when a newspaper um, inaccurately reported that he had died, Twain wrote, reports of, reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. Um, and in this case, my focus is, is still much more, and, I'm, and our newsroom is focused on this too, 
on what happens between not just now and election day, but even after election day and through inauguration day. We're at such an extraordinary uh, historical moment. Um, I think that it's very hard to think about, and, 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 and I have this, uh, it's almost superstitious. Um, we've made so many mistakes underestimating as news organizations and as news um, uh, professionals, underestimating Donald Trump in the past. Um, I see the same polling that you and your readers see, um, but I'm much more focused on, on uh, what happens and even what happens after election day and whether we have a peaceful transfer of power or a con peaceful continuation of power. Well, well, let me pick up on something that, that John said, uh, that in addition to this question of what happens, and I understand that Trump is, Trump is still there, he could be there another four plus years, um, it's very possible. Polling could be wrong, of course. Uh, but there is also something happening on, on the left and on the Democratic side. Is it sort of the Joe Biden wing? Is it the, uh, you know, AOC uh, wing of the party that, that, that becomes mm -hmm. dominant? Uh, so, for instance, at the Washington Post, uh, do you believe there's kind of a, a, a decent amount of thought and maybe investigative resources being put into thinking about some of the leaders that are emerging on the left and uh, being perhaps put through a lot of the same sort of um, analysis that, that that's happening on with Trump. Okay, Alex, such a great question. And I, and I should say that even while I am, um, I find it hard in my own sort of um, agenda to look forward to that question, I do think it's vital. The leadership of both parties um, at the Post, we're also talking about one of the things John referred to earlier. We are, our success in the Bezos era has really been predicated on, we can credit Jeff Bezos, he's given, he has the, uh, you know, the secret for a newspaper to survive, we joke is a billionaire owner, but we've had a huge uptick in interest and in readership. A lot of that is explained by Donald Trump. Trump has, although he insults us daily, has been an extraordinary boon for American journalism. And so one of the questions in the newsroom is, what happens to us after Trump? Um, what sort of coverage? Um, it, to me, the questions are really engaging and interesting. And I have to tell you, as someone who likes thinking about these questions, that we are very distracted right now. And we are probably, it's a really good question, we are probably not putting the energy into what happens, including your good question about what happens to the leadership of both parties in a post-Trump era. Well, it, so John, maybe kind of going back to you on, on, on a similar point. Um, I mean, I think there are quite a few voters uh, that seem to indicate that they're, that they kind of like uh, Joe Biden, feel that he has a history of being centrist, moderate, sensible, uh, but they're not sure either because of his age uh, what what happens afterward? Whether he has uh, what it takes to potentially kind of you know push back maybe some things on the left that some voters are not not as thrilled about and not necessarily looking forward to as much as other things. I mean, what are your thoughts about how how things in the Democratic Party play out? Is it? it I mean, it, does it become Joe Biden and and people like him over time, or is it going to seemingly what's happening now? Is it going to potentially move more leftward? Um, you know, to state the obvious, we won't know until we find out if uh, um, there's a Biden presidency. Um, um, if there is, then I think the question would be, um, uh, at his age, uh, how commanding a figure uh, does he become? Does he make this his party? Um, do people feel like, well, I, I better step in line because uh, there's a, there's a, if I want influence, I, I'd better... Uh, defer uh, to this kind of powerful figure. Usually the presidency occupies that kind of position uh, as the leader of, uh, uh, leader of the party. Um, Biden was never, even as a younger man, was the most kind of commanding in, in terms of his uh, public presence. I think he's got a, a very vital and more commanding individual presence. He can connect with, with uh, voters on an individual way and, and with colleagues in the Washington uh, uh, arena. Uh, he connects in an engaging way, but he's not a, a theatrical president in the style of Reagan or, or for that matter, Obama um, or Trump. Uh, so how command he is, and, and, and bluntly, he, um, he is old. Um, you know, watching him in, or in the primary season, you, you could see that this is a, somebody who's a, 
You wouldn't say with Joe Biden, oh my gosh, he, watching him campaign, he, he could be 10, 15, 20 years old or younger than he is. He'd say, oh no, there's a man who's 77 and shows it. Uh, uh, I, I think long term, there is a, there's a, just a, uh, uh, there's a, a fault line within the Democratic Party uh, between people who fundamentally respect the establishment and those who think the establishment needs a really bracing, almost root and branch challenge. So, so I know we only have two minutes left, so I'll ask a very quick question uh, from, from each of you. Uh, obviously, both of you have had uh, uh, terrific, successful careers in, in journalism, uh, but journalism has changed, uh, and we've talked about that uh, today. If somebody was coming to you today, a young, a young Brighton or Pittsburgh uh, student, thinking about a career in, in journalism, what would be your, would you encourage them, discourage them, or what, what would be your, your advice? And maybe we can start off with uh, Tom. Well, I would be encouraging because I've um, uh, had such uh, uh, because this uh, uh, career has and and the business is so important, more important than ever, arguably. And though we haven't um, exactly uh, nailed down, Alex, as you know well, the economics and the future finances of journalism, which would bring stability to the industry, we know from our readership numbers that there's more demand for good journalism than ever. And we need smart young people. And I would encourage them to, to um, embrace the opportunities that are out there. And I have... Um, uh, and I said, I guess I'd say do so with eyes wide open. Um, but I think this is going to be an area of expansion and of vitality going forward. And, and, and John, your, your advice? Uh, sure. And before I give that advice, I just, uh, while well, there's still a moment here, uh, I see a bunch of uh, names uh, uh, in the audience, uh, people like Janice Bullard, who if it's the same one, uh, if that's, she uh, it was just a few houses down from me. We went to school together and Jill Hay is also in my, um, uh, uh, my era and uh, the Kissels who their, uh, uh, their son Aaron Kissel is a, an important uh, leader of our, our business side. Uh, uh, um, and, and others who I know. Uh, so anyway, I appreciate everybody joining in. I would say yes. Um, the, uh, 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 we live in a disruptive age and, and probably in almost any profession, if you, if you say, well, I want to go in and I want really settled expectations of uh, uh, what uh, my career is going to be like. And I, I hope to join a place and stay there for 20, 30, 40 years. Not uncommon in the journalism world I grew up in where there were you know, at the time I left the post, I'd been there 21 years. I'd say I was probably at the median. Half had been there longer than me, half below. Uh, pretty sto astonishing. That certainly would not be the case of the Washington Post today. If, uh, if it was 21 years, you'd be at the top of the, near the top uh, of it. Um, we live in a disruptive age where you need flexibility and you, uh, um, uh, you have to realize that you're not just inheriting a, a status quo. You're, you're, you're kind of inventing the future. That's true in journalism and in, in other professions. The thing about journalism, it's, uh, it is good work that I think uh, done well makes society better and uh, you can have an awful lot of fun doing it. So uh, uh, good work and, and fun, that's a, pretty, uh, that's a pretty damn good combo. It has been for me and uh, I think it will continue to be so. Thank you very much, John Harris and Tom yeah, thanks, for, for joining us today. I also want to uh, briefly thank again our sponsors of uh, today's program, Arm Brewster Capital Management, Burt Group, the Estate Legacy and Long-Term Care Planning Center of Western New York, and our gold sponsor, Bond, Shenick and King. Uh, thank you all very much. Sorry for the slight technical difficulties at the beginning of the program, uh, but we hope you've enjoyed a really interesting discussion, and uh, please keep on reading the Rochester Beacon. Thank you again, Tom, Tom and John. Sure, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.